Hello and welcome to the 2021 Utah Pollinator Pursuit Training. My name is Sarah Woodbury and I am the Communications and Outreach Director for Wild Utah Project. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, we are really, really grateful for you. This project working to conserve monarchs and bumblebees is only possible because of you all being here and being willing to volunteer and dedicate your time to this cause. Um, as, as I'm sure you all do, I really love these insects and the systems that depend on them. So I'm personally really grateful for each of you. Uh, so thank you again. And as we begin this training, I also just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that with many of us based in or near Salt Lake City, um, we are on the unceded ancestral and traditional lands of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute people. And I'd just like to pay my respect to Indigenous elders, both past and present. Um, I also recognize that a statement like this can only be meaningful when coupled with authentic relationships, um, as well as sustained commitment to the Indigenous community. And as we find ourselves on the landscape for this project, we just wanted to invite each of us to immerse ourselves in the histories and current realities of the landscape and local Indigenous groups that have been here. Um, and to know what land I'm on, I personally use an app called Native Land. Uh, there are other great resources as well. Um, yeah, just wanted to start with that. And then on a similar note, we just wanted to take a moment to talk about um, how Wild Utah Project and our partners on this project really value the diverse perspectives and experiences um, that each of you bring to this project as well as our other staff and partners. And so we just wanted to point out our diversity, equity and inclusion policy, which is outlined on our website. And I will also share it in the chat in just a moment. Um, essentially, we just ask um, and expect that everyone treats each other with respect on this project. And if you have any questions about this or you see something that you would like to talk about or report, uh, please reach out to me, Sarah at wildutahproject.org or anyone on our team and we would love to discuss it with you. Um, and so just a quick note on the agenda as well. I'm gonna uh, proceed the slide. So, we are going to have two parts today, um, the first of which is recommended for all participants, those who have participated previously, as well as those who are new to the project. And then we will have a Q&A that will focus on um, those who previously participated, so they're free to hop off if they'd like to. Um, and then we will move into uh, our part two, which will talk a little bit more about identification specifically, um, provide some, some resources for folks starting out. Uh, and then we'll have another Q&A session as well as review the frequently asked questions on the website. So with that, we will uh, hand it over to Amanda Barth, who is going to talk a little bit about the big picture of this project um, and get us started. Thank you so much, Amanda of bees than anywhere else in North America, with at least 1,100 known species of native bees. Utah is also, uh, also has over 100 species of butterflies, hundreds of native moth species, and many species of flies, beetles, and wasps that are valuable pollinators for our natural ecosystem and agricultural lands. Utah's agricultural re industry relies heavily on pollination, Fruit trees, melons, berries, beans, and peppers are just some of the important crops impacted by pollination services, many of which are, provide, are performed by native bees. Healthy functioning ecosystems offer diverse habitat that supports many types of pollinators. So if you see many types of bees, butterflies, and other insects, you get, an, a, you get a sense of the environmental health. Unfortunately, many important insect pollinators are seeing significant and worrying declines. Some of the biggest threats they face are from land use practices that involve heavy pesticides, heavy pesticide use, intensive farming, and urban development that eliminates vital habitat for foraging, breeding, and overwintering. Warming temperatures, shifting weather patterns, drought, storms, and heavy fire seasons are just some of the consequences of climate change 
that also threaten pollinator diversity and abundance. When we see a sharp loss in pollinators, this is a big red flag that our environmental health is in serious decline. There was a time when spring and summer blooms across the West were eagerly visited by the ubiquitous monarch butterfly and the Western bumblebee. Their numbers were so abundant that their disappearance was unimaginable. The arrival of, of each of these species signified the change of the seasons and traditions formed around their movements. The Western population of monarchs have historically arrived in Utah as early as April, migrating eastward from their overwintering grounds along the Pacific coast. Since overwintering counts began in the 1980s, monarch populations have fallen from the millions to fewer than 2,000, a loss of 99.9%. With so few butterflies making it back to breeding grounds across the arid west, it is difficult to predict where vital habitats such as riparian corridors are being used for migration routes, or where the most suitable breeding habitat with ample milkweed and nectar resources will see any monarch activity. Milkweed, the only plants that monarchs can use for larval hosts, is often in limited supply or has been exposed to pesticides that make it toxic to monarch caterpillars. The Western bumblebee was once the most commonly seen bumblebee throughout its historical range, from just west of the Rocky Mountains to the Pacific coast and north into Western Canada. Their sudden decline since the 1990s, attributed to the threats of pesticide, pesticide use, habitat loss, and exotic par parasites and pathogens alerted the need for careful population monitoring. Annual surveys for bumblebees across this range have found very few Western bumblebees, suggesting that its range has decreased by more than 40% and that they have been extirpated from in some regions. Current estimates project that this species has declined by approximately 89%. While many conservation actions are needed to help protect these vital animals, such as modified pest management plans, reduced pollution, and mitigation of invasive species, it's imperative that we understand how monarch butterflies rely on suitable breeding habitat and migratory corridors, and how bumblebees are distributed through a landscape of disappearing habitat. Data for monarchs and bumblebees are extremely limited for Utah. Specifically, we don't have much, mon much information on how monarchs use milkweed patches throughout the course of the breeding season. We also don't know much about the late summer, early fall super generation and the path that those butterflies take back to their overwintering grounds. We have very few examples of bumblebee sightings for a, rare, for a number of rare species over many years. And we need better resolution of our understanding of where essential nectar resources might be supporting diverse pollinator communities. Based on data collected across Utah by community scientists in 2019, multiple milkweed species are distributed across the state in wet meadow and desert habitats. There are regions of the state, however, with little to no monarch presence of uh, monarch presence data. In much of southern Utah, for instance, it's likely that these milkweed provide late summer breeding habitat for the supergeneration of monarchs that will ultimately migrate back to coastal wintering, overwintering grounds, but we have no sightings of monarchs during these warmer months. There are very few recorded sightings of rare bumblebee species since 2007. Since bumblebees are generally found in wet, in meadow habitat and at higher altitudes, much of the mountainous landscape across Utah is likely to support bumblebee populations where sightings would be especially likely during wildflower blooms. This gets at the heart of the information we're trying to gather this year through community science data collection. We ask where suitable monarch breeding habitat occurs, wh which milkweed species are present, and what is the approximate density of these milkweed stands. In these habitat patches, is there evidence of monarch activity such as eggs or caterpillar damage on milkweed leaves throughout the breeding season? Near these habitat patches, are there also flowering plants that serve as nectar resources for adult monarchs? Which species of these, of these flowers is present? We are encouraging any and all monarch sightings across the state of Utah with, with photo submissions for, for species verification. This is extremely important. 
this year, maybe a wash for monarchs in Utah, but we're hoping with extra eyes looking, we might see some. We're also inviting all submissions of bumblebee sightings with photographs of, the bee, of both the bees and the flowers that they are visiting. This could be in urban settings or out on hikes or on recreational trips. We are hoping with, uh, we're hoping to get a clear picture of where all of our bumblebee species occur. To give you an update on the data collected by Utah Pollinator Pursuit Volunteers in 2020, we, we have a pretty good idea of where monarchs are using breeding habitat in the northern half of the state, in wet meadows and along rivers and lake shores. But we are still lacking much information on where they might occur in southern Utah and in desert habitats. This means there are still huge reasons, re excuse me, regions of the state with little to no monarch presence data. We still have questions about late summer breeding in southern Utah that supports the super generation that migrates back to overwintering sites, and we still have no sightings of monarchs in southern Utah. Of course, 2020 was an exceptionally dry year, so we're crossing our fingers that a little more precipitation this year could yield some better chances to see some monarchs maybe at the end of the summer in southern Utah. There are still very few recorded sightings of rare bumblebees in Utah, but last year, our Utah Pollinator Pursuit volunteers found hundreds of bumblebees across the state. We have also detected several rare species and are hoping for more sightings this year with some return visits to those sites. All of those black dots with, uh, with yellow outlines, those are bumblebee sightings across the state from last year. Utah's bumblebee species are generally found in scrubland and forests usually and meadows. Uh, usually at higher altitudes. So we're still asking folks to go look around in the mountainous landscapes across the state from April through October. And with that, I will hand this over to Mary. Thank you so Thank much, you so Amanda, that background. Um, if you can uh, progress some of those bullet points there on our overview. So if, if you kind of missed the introductions, my name is Mary Pendergast. I'm an ecologist working with Wild Utah Project. And today I'm gonna be presenting uh, about how you as a community scientist can participate on the Utah Pollinator Pursuit. And so on the next slide, <clears throat> See if we can, there we go. So the two primary ways uh, to participate in the project. So firstly, if you would like, you can take on a stewardship site and that is a role as data steward for a particular location, meaning you may um, pick a site from a list which we will share from you or share with you and you can always review that um, and actually select a site of your choosing. You can also, add to that list. Um, and with these stewardship sites, it is our hope that they get visit um, anywhere between one and three times during the field season. And again, that field season could start now, particularly if you're in southern regions of the state. Um, it may start uh, in early May, um, depending again where you are. Um, and it can go into late September into early October, depending on the year. Um, if you only uh, can visit a site once, but you're helping us, you know, fill in those gaps in the southern and western portion of the state, that is okay too. We really appreciate your help um, gathering data across the state. And the second way to participate, you can, you can do both of these, is just to record opportunistically. So if you are out hiking or walking in your neighborhood, um, you can record observations of monarchs and bumblebees, as well as any patches of milkweed that um, you come across as you are out and about. And the next slide we have, um, so this is a screenshot of the monarch conservation page. There is also a Utah pollinator pursuit page. So if you search for either of those, both of those pages have a get involved tab. And if you click on that tab, you will see the same screen on the next slide. Um, it will take you to those two options, becoming a pollinator uh, site steward or recording 
pollinator sightings. And then if you can just progress there. So if you suggest, if you select the learn more button um, on the site stewardship, you will get to this, these six steps. And essentially it's just a reminder that you can always review those protocols. So you all already have some of the access to some of those PDFs um, and we can review those as well. Um, attend and review the training. So the link to today's training will be added um, to update from 2020 to 2021. Um, there's also detailed steps in number three on how to download the application to whatever phone you may be using. Um, and then number four will take you to a link to the list of sites that are carefully selected by our state conservation, rare plant and insect biologists. Um, and it's also editable so that you can add your name to it or you can add sites of your choosing to that list. And point number five will take you to uh, a link to a map that was carefully crafted again by our state biologists to help um, get more information about the sites before you select where you'd like to go out in the field. And then number six discusses how to actually log those data. So remember you, um, everything you're about to see, you will have access to on the website. And we also often share links to these same things on the emails. If you are registered for this webinar, you will be receiving those emails. So if we can progress again. So just a reminder, if you instead selected the learn more about recording pollinator sites opportunistically, you can progress there and it will take you to just three simple steps. A reminder that you can always review those protocols. We have those PDFs and short presentations for you um, as well as down, how to download the app and log data. Okay. And if you do, if you are interested in the data stewardship sites, it will take you to a, um, an Excel link, and that, that's okay, Amanda, I think there's a little, that's fine. Um, it will take you to this list of stewardship sites. You'll notice there's two tabs at the bottom. There's a Monarch Habitat Assessment tab, and then that second tab is the suggested sites for bumblebees. So in orange here, you have stewardship sites that are likely to have suitable monarch habitat. The gray sites represent sites that are likely to have both bumblebee and monarchs in them. You'll notice that column, that first column on the left tells you the land jurisdiction. So if it's on forest service land or department of interior land or park service land, it gives you an indication of that. And then the next two columns allow you to add your name if you would like to take that site on, um, as well as the date or dates um, just kind of a range of when you expect to go out there. Um, as you move from left to right, you can see there's more information about the sites, a site name, focus area, which is usually alluding to the county, the specific location information, the likelihood of milkweed being present. Um, there's also a priority ranking. So if you wanna, if you don't mind going uh, far from home and you want to select kind of a higher priority site, you can always do that. Um, or you can just pick things based on your uh, radius of interest, how far you want to travel. There's also a link to go to a map specific to that site. So you can do a little planning before you head out. You can scope it out if you want to take a four wheel drive vehicle or if you're just going off a main road. Um, we also indicate details as to, is it moderate, easy, or strenuous? Will it involve some hiking? Um, and if you were able to see further right on this um, Excel sheet, there's even more information about the species you're likely to see. Um, and if you go ahead to progress the slide to the next tab, the suggested bumblebee sites, which are in yellow, um, the same information is available. So these are more opportunistic. And again, you can add to this list. So if you're out hiking somewhere, you go regularly with your family, or you just have a one-off observation of a bumblebee, and you want to add that to the site list and maybe return because you notice maybe some of the flowers aren't quite in bloom yet, and you want to go back when you think there might be more activity, 
you could certainly add your own site to that list and try to flesh out the, the information for each of, that, each of those columns. The next slide. Um, so if you recall, when you go to the site stewardship page, not only is there a link to the potential site list, but there's also a link, I believe it's step five, um, to this map. And then if you click the slide one more time, you can select any one of these points on the map and it gives you a little information about that location, a site name, the land jurisdiction, um, the specific information, a little bit more about access, is, does it require hiking or not, that sort of thing. So it gives you a little more time to, or a little more information to plan and select the site you might be interested in visiting. If we can progress to the next slide. So again, you have all of this information, so you don't need to furiously write this down. You have this in the form of a PDF. I believe it is also still, um, there's a video about using the app as well on the website. So no need to furiously write things down. You have access to this, but just as a review, um, to download the application on your phone, you can use whatever app store you use on your device and look for the Survey123 ArcGIS icon. It's that green icon you see. Then the next step, once you select that, um, it should prompt you to download it. It may ask you for an email address or sign in information. There's an option to download or open without any of that information. So you shouldn't need to share any of that. Um, step three, close the application. And in my case, I was just able to close the application and open it up again. And that worked just fine. For some people, you need to close the application and actually paste the link to the app in your, um, in your browser. And then it will send you to the application. And you should only have to do this the one time, the first time you, you download the app. And again, you don't necessarily need to jot this link down. Um, it is there on the website. So you should be able to just copy and paste it in. Um, so your phone will then just open the application and you will have a new icon within the app, the Utah Pollinator Pursuit. Um, and just a reminder, if you already have the application, if you're a return participant, you will need to um, update. So you should be prompted for an update uh, when you go to open the application. Um, and once you have it downloaded, you can just select that Utah Pollinator Pursuit application and a blue icon to collect data will appear. So you'll notice at the top, this is a screenshot of my phone. Um, when I most recently went to use the app, I could see that an update or a couple updates were available. You may have several available depending on when you opened it last. So you just select that right arrow and it will go ahead and update the application for you. And next steps, once you're in the app, I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly because you all have this again in a PDF. And we also have two roughly seven minute videos that you can always go back to if you have questions about logging data. So I'm gonna go fairly quickly here. Um, if you can just progress that whole slide, Amanda, thank you. Um, probably the most important thing to remember is to make sure that you enter your name in the entry as well as um, the whether you're doing a specific stewardship site or you're just doing an opportunistic observation. Um, and make sure that your phone, the GPS in your phone is active so that there is a location that's being recorded for your observation. Your name and the actual location, super, super important. And then just progressing to the next two slides there. Um, also very crucial uh, for collecting observations, please, please include an image. You'll see the butter Im butterfly image on the left-hand side. Um, if you don't record an image of either a monarch, the milkweed plant that you observed or a bumblebee, it's really hard for us to use these data. So please make sure those images get uh, updated. And just a little point of reference, if the butterfly or the bumblebee is moving very quickly, it can be very hard to get a good image. 
I have found myself that it's easier to take a video on my phone, enter all the other data in the observation, and then go back and take a, um, a screen grab um, of a frame of that video, select that, and then upload that after the fact. So you don't have to upload the images right there. You can progress through um, your data entry and upload images at the end. And that can be a lot easier at times. Um, you'll see some multiple choice here about questions about the habitat. Um, again, options to upload images of the most common flowers in the area, as well as a general habitat photo. Um, and it's also very helpful for us, if you see on the far right hand side, um, letting us know roughly how much time you spent making your observation. Um, this lets us know if, if you didn't spend a lot of time, that's totally fine. We just might want to go back and return to that site. And then you go ahead and submit those data for an opportunistic sighting. And for the opportunistic bumblebee sighting, very similar questions being asked. Again, same thing. If it's tricky to get a good image of the bumblebee, you might go ahead and take a video. Something I wanna note that is new this year, you can see those images of different species of bumblebee. So you can take your best stab at what species you're looking at. And there are more options this year. And you can also click on those thumbnail images of the bumblebee drawings and, and zoom in. So those are really helpful for trying to get an accurate ID. And there's still an option of unknown species if you're not sure, which is totally fine. Um, and just progressing through here, very similar, looking for pictures of uh, where the bumblebee is um, landing, what flower and what the activity at the time of observation is. Um, general multiple choice questions about the habitat, more images of common flowers, as well as a larger um, surrounding area image. Again, for the opportunistic bumblebee survey, all those are very useful. Okay. And just progressing through here. So now when you are monitoring a stewardship site, if you um, are taking on a site on the list or adding to the list and wanting to visit it multiple times, or maybe you can only go once, but you're helping us fill in that gap in central um, or southern Utah or western Utah, um, it's really important to pay attention to a few other things here. So of course, we want you to select um, that you're doing a site rather than just a opportunistic observation. Um, we also would really like to know whether this is your first visit to a site or if you're returning. Um, we have an addition of roughly how big the area is that you're observing, that you're surveying. And again, multiple choice, it just gives us a rough idea you know, are we talking about one acre or somewhere between three and six acres? Um, that kind of ballpark information is very helpful to us. Um, some other things you'll notice that we are really hoping on that first uh, visit that you're letting us know if there is milkweed present and if so, which species, which species and roughly how many. Um, so there are images of the species of milkweed you're likely to run into and similar to those bumblebee images, you can click on those thumbnail photos and get a zoomed in image, which increases your chances of um, identifying what species of milkweed you have. If we can go ahead to the next slide. Um, we also ask about pictures of other flowering plants, roughly the color and shape of those plants. And importantly, at a stewardship site, we're asking you to take note of any life stages of monarchs you might see. So that includes eggs and caterpillars and butterflies. And if the answer is none, that is um, an option as well. And we'd also like you to indicate roughly how many of those life stages you see. So again, categorical options, are you seeing less than 10 eggs or too many to count, right? And those different categories in, in between. So that's really helpful, again, for our biologists to prioritize whether they need to go back out to a site or not. Um, next slide, I think, yeah, and if we can keep, there we go. So again, habitat, um, categorical questions, you have options there. Um, super important for particularly your first visit to a, a stewardship site 
if you can spend 45 minutes at a site, that would be really helpful. So if you can imagine yourself, maybe you're in a wet meadow um, adjacent to agriculture lands or something like that, and it's fairly flat, but it's a large area, you may spend 45 minutes um, looking to make sure you didn't miss a patch of milkweed. So it's really nice if you, that at least that first visit, are able to spend 45 minutes. And if you can't, that's okay. Just be super straightforward. Go ahead and put that you only spent 15 minutes and then we may head out again or send some folks out again to that site. Um, and any um, notes that you can include are also really helpful for any of these observations that you're making. Um, the habitat photo, um, uploading at least one of the general or surrounding habitat is very helpful to us because again, it allows us to see uh, where you um, where you have covered and kind of where you were standing when you when you took most of your photos. And I think with that, we may if we can progress. Yes. So again, all the PDFs you already have access to. Um, we'll make sure all those links are updated on the website as well as the most recent um, short videos that go through this in even more detail. And so we're, we're a little bit ahead of schedule here. So we have plenty of time um, for a question and answer session. And with that, I think I'll turn it over to Sarah who's been tracking your questions in the chat. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, so we have just a couple of questions. Let me get to the first one. So the first question that we have is from Eric Allen who says, after downloading the app, I, ch uh, I chose to go forward without logging in and it started downloading the survey but stalled out at the halfway point. Now it won't bring up the survey in the app anymore. How do I fix this? I haven't heard of this happening, but my suggestion would be, I don't know if it was an interruption in connectivity or something. My suggestion would to be to make sure that the application is uninstalled and um, you could potentially even just turn off and turn on your Wi-Fi or whatever connection you're using. Make sure that that, that connection is stable and then just start the process again. That would be, I think, the most intuitive. If you are still struggling with the app after that, um, you can feel free to email um, Amanda or Mindy or myself and we, will, we can help um, troubleshoot that with you. Perfect. Um, and then, oh, and also I, if anyone wants to unmute and share their video, you can now. So if you'd rather ask your question uh, verbally, you're free to do that. Um, I'll just keep going through the chat in the meantime. Um, so Jan Kennington says, is the amount of time you spend including everything, uh, travel and car, hiking to the place, which we have ans the answer of yes, it does include travel time. And can I, I'm sorry, this is Mindy, but if I can add to that, um, the, I think that the, the site stewardship gives you only uh, a few selections of how much time you spent because we're asking people to spend 45 minutes, but in the notes, it would be helpful if you let us know how long it took you to get to the site, etc. Um, we just wanted to make it a little bit easier and more understandable in terms of what you know, time, I guess, means. Thanks. Perfect. We have another question from Jan that says, are the pictures of the milkweed and bees on the app? Yes. Yes, tap on, on those thumbnails and you'll, you'll get a photo of the milkweed and you'll get the diagrams of the bumblebees. Perfect. Um, and then Isaac Stone asks, if you want to add a site, what sites are permissible? Yeah, and I guess uh, my answer to that is, um, if, you, if you go to private property, be sure you know the landowner or you own the property yourself. Otherwise, um, it's really up to you. Uh, if it's public property, your, you know, your property, et cetera. Yeah, I will say, so last year we had folks who regularly hiked along the Jordan River with their family and, you know, added 
added that as a site or parks they regularly go to. So um, it doesn't, you don't have to be in a remote area. It can be within the wild urban interface, right? Parks and cemeteries and, you know, hiking, um, walking around your neighborhood. Uh, there are places on the various campuses that have milkweed. So yeah. um, any, any of those would be interesting, um, particularly if you see milkweed or you see bumblebee activity, um, you see nectaring resources or flowering plants um, that look like they're providing good habitat and you might visit a couple times a year, those, um, those would be good culprits for adding, adding to the list. Perfect. Um, and then Marissa Harrison is asking about the record, or no, Kelly Johnson, sorry, is asking about the recording. Yes, we are recording this and we'll be sending it out to everyone who participated or signed up for the project. So you'll be receiving a link to watch it. Um, so feel free to hop off if you mentioned. Um, and then we have a question from Matteo Schumach who says, with the bumblebees, are we looking for Bombus occidentalis only or other species as well? We are looking for all the bumblebees in Utah. I want to have a good, thorough uh, detection of as many species that occur and where they occur as possible. We have 18 species of uh, native bumblebees in Utah. We didn't detect any Bombus occidentalis last year, uh, but every other uh, observation that was submitted was extremely helpful. And we did get some rare species um, as part of our submission. So that was phenomenal. Uh, it would be great if we could pick up some, some um, photographs of Bombus occidentalis. And this is one of the reasons why submitting a photo with your observation is absolutely paramount. Uh, otherwise, we, there's no way for us to, to verify or really report this data to um, the regional uh, databases and, and managers that are, that are keeping track of uh, the broad range of Bombus occidentalis across, across the West. We want every bumblebee species you can see. Perfect. And there are lots of resources for identifying bumblebees that um, we'll be talking about later in this presentation as well. So yeah, we have different resources to help with that. Um, and then we have a question from um, Aline Devad, hopefully I pronounced that right, who has kind of a specific question about helping, getting help selecting a site. So if folks have kind of questions on where to go, what should they do? Yeah, I think if you have a question about one that's already on the list, I might, um, if you're okay with this, Mindy, I think I would direct you to Mindy. And if you have a question about a site that you have in mind that you want to add to the list, um, why don't you go ahead and email me and that way we'll kind of tag team that effort. Does that sound okay to you, Mindy? Yep. Cool. Perfect. Um, okay, so now to Marissa Harrison's question who says, are there any tips for knowing if you're looking at a bumblebee versus a different fuzzy bee? I realized looking back at my entries from last year that I may have submitted some digger bees. Yeah, that's possible. Um, we do have some, uh, we spend some time on the back end doing quality control and quality assurance. So we do go through these photos. Um, it, you know, it's, it's not always super clear, but, um, the, the guides that we've included, our, our illustrations for the, the different species um, have more detail that we're hoping is, uh, will help you identify what, you're, what bees you, you've observed. Um, and if you submit a digger bee, it's, it's not the end of the world. We'll catch it at, on, our, on our end. So it's fine. Regardless, it's really great that we have people that are peeling their eyes for, um, for bees out on their walks. So, one way or another, it, it's helping us. Perfect. Um, I think I've done the same thing, Marissa. Yeah, so you're not alone. <laughs> um, Sarah S., uh, says, I participated for the first time last year and really enjoyed it. Is there a way for folks to know somehow if the data they submitted were usable or not? If they weren't really usable on the whole, it'd be nice to make modifications for this season. That's a, a great question. I really appreciate it, Sarah. Um, I would say, go ahead and email me. My email is on the website, I believe, mindywheeler at utah.gov. And 
Um, I, I was one that broke down the data for the monarch and Amanda was the one that broke down the data for the bumblebee. So um, if you have questions about both of those, you should probably email each one of us. But um, so whichever questions you have, just email either one of us and we can, um, we can look through that for you. I did get a number of emails um, with photographs saying, you know, before I submit this, is this a bumblebee? What species is it? What would you say? And so I, um, we we had some back and forths on on a number of on on a number of photographs, and um, I shared the resources that I refer to also. So those those are questions that I'm I'm perfectly happy to uh, help answer, and my email address is also on the last slide of this. So abarth at utah.gov. Yeah, and worst worst case scenario, you take a picture of a bumblebee or a bee that's not a bumblebee, and it gets caught on the back end. Um, so it's not the end of the world, like Amanda said. Yes. Um, okay, so another data question. So Talon Gardner asks, if we have photos and data from years past, but we weren't on the project, can that data be submitted still? I would say that it would be possible if you have uh, data or um, location stamps on those photos, that would be great. Location and, and hopefully date as well. I think the date is really important. So do you want, if that's the case, they probably aren't using the application, you'd prefer that to be emailed in as 2020 data? Is that? Or yeah, whatever um, year it might be, yeah. Um, if, if that, if the photo has all that information embedded in it, that would be great. And you, sh you should have all of our emails in, in, the, in the email addresses in the emails you've received, but I believe the last slide of this presentation has our emails as well. Yes. Um, are there any other questions? Anyone who wants to unmute themselves and share a video to ask a question, feel free to do so. Um, oh, okay, we have another question coming in. So Audrey Cruz asks about data from Northern Arizona. Is that something that we are accepting on the project? We, we do have um, some partners with Dinosaur National Monument who are submitting um, monarch observation data and even bumblebee data um, from their, within their boundaries and that does go into Colorado. And I think we do have a little bit of data from um, Idaho as well. I don't see a harm in submitting Northern Arizona data. If you have bumblebees, it'd be great. If you have milkweed that you've seen there or monarchs in that area, I mean, that helps gives a, give us some context, if anything. So um, I don't see it as being harmful. I, I think we, I, we can't necessarily claim it as Utah data, but we, you know, it, it it would, I don't see it be, being harmful. So go ahead if you'd like to, it'd be great. Perfect, and we have another question from Peter who says, what is a good time window to go to sites around Salt Lake? Uh, so mm, late, if you're going to sites uh, for Monarch, um, it's good to have an idea as to what might be growing there by early June, um, and then keep on going back through September if you can, if if monarchs are or your interest in those sites. Okay. Bumblebees, I'll let uh, Amanda answer that question. Yeah, so, um, so earlier in the season, uh, we will see bumblebee activity further north or, up, you know, um, further north, but um, the peak detection time for at least the mountainous regions, we would say is, is June through August. Um, however, we did get some submissions of sightings for some rare species in Southern Utah down in uh, Washington County in October. So Bombus sonoris is, is really um, a pretty special thing to see. And we, we did get an October sighting for that. So, um, you know, the window I would say is really April through October. And I know that there are some Bombus hunti already active in like Utah County. So 
now as soon as possible with bumblebees is great. And then, you know, as, as long as you um, see them, so we'll, take, we'll take observations. It's, it's helpful for us to know. Perfect. So we have a question from Aline who says, is it important to know if someone else is already covering my neighborhood? There are quite a few milkweed plants around me. My, my guess is that you might run into somebody else who might be covering your neighborhood with running around with their phone and taking photos and stuff. But um, I, I would say go for it and cover as much of your neighborhood as you can. And then we have a question. Um, oh, I'm kind of hearing an echo. I wonder. Oh, thank you, Mary. Um, so we have a question about bumblebee activity and what time of day they're active. I think we'll be covering this later in the presentation, but if not, um, and dear Amanda, if you want to answer that one. Yeah, I don't actually have that in the presentation. It's a good question. Uh, bumblebees are really, they are capable of flying from dawn to dusk that you, they maybe not completely at dusk, but you might still see them flying around at sunset. So they'll, they'll fly in low light. They could be active all day long. Perfect. Okay, I think we've covered those questions. Um, if folks have any more questions, we do have um, until 625 when our second part uh, starts. Okay, we do have another question from Gage Bentley who asks the same question, but for monarchs. So, oh, are there days of the week that monarchs are more active? Monarchs weekends. Days of the they weekend. love weekends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, like I said before, monarchs should, well, we hope that we will get monarchs this year in Utah. We just don't know. They, because they have, um, they have, such a wide range in the West for this population. We might see an increase in numbers during their breeding season. So they might be kind of like uh, loading up on, on the, the population numbers possibly. We might see them as early as now in Southern Utah. Um, but, you know, it's, it's gonna be hit or miss this year, you know, just to be, to be completely up front, it, there is a, it's a very, very small population. If we do see them in Northern Utah, it might not be until May. Um, and if we do see them, it's a unicorn. Seriously, take a photo, submit that photo because we are, we're really hoping that they, that they make it into Utah this year because we really do provide a lot of extremely valuable breeding habitat every summer for monarchs. And Take it, take it from me, if the monarch is on the move, it's, you might wanna start by taking a video. Um, and then you can always take a frame as a photo because it's really hard to get a photo unless they're silly and not moving around or something like that. And, and keep in mind, even if you don't see an adult monarch butterfly, um, you know, finding these potentially suitable habitats with milkweed is super valuable. And even if you find, you go to one of the sites on the list and you don't find milkweed, that information is really helpful to us because it allows us to prioritize our efforts elsewhere. So um, don't be disheartened if you do not see a monarch. And with monarch, um things. We have a question from Lori who asks, do the monarchs in Utah migrate to Mexico or to California? So there is, this is, that's a really good question. Um, there are some indications that there is movement between Mexico, the, the Eastern population and the Western population through Arizona down into Mexico in both directions. It's very possible that there, that some of these uh, butterflies migrate directly down into um, into Mexico, uh, and, and it's very, there's, um, compelling genetic evidence that, that points at, um, monarchs from Mexico coming up into Utah and, and showing up in Utah in our, in our breeding grounds before the Western population makes it here. So it's, it's very likely that Utah is serving as a mixing ground between those two gene pools. And that, makes it, it, it highlights how important our state is for 
supporting for breeding habitat that supports the populations. So uh, it, it's very possible. Um, the, the kinds of things that help us understand that kind of information are um, the tagging programs that have been, um, that, that are in, in effect, um, and, and there are a number of partners that are working on, on those tagging programs. Perfect. Um, and then we had a note from, let's see, from Adrian saying that Las Vegas has had monarch sightings already, which is uh, really exciting. Um, and yeah, I don't see any other questions in that. Um, we have about one minute. So yeah, just feel free to pop those in as you have them. Um, and we will start section two in just one minute. Great questions, everybody. And we have time for questions at the end of this um, second and last section. So thanks, keep the questions coming. Okay, so let's go ahead and start our second part of this training. So we'll be going a little bit into some details about identification for milkweed, um, monarchs and bumblebees, and you'll also find um, or, or be directed to resources where you can find this information. So yeah, without further ado, um, Mindy, if you would take it from here. Sure, great. Um, uh, yeah, uh, my name is Mindy Wheeler. I'm the State of Utah Rare Plant Conservation Coordinator. And before I start this, I just I also want to say um, that map that you can click on um, in the uh, in the website it's very interactive. You can turn on and off layers. You can zoom in and out. You can change the base map so you can really kind of tell where you want to be, where you are, how how close roads are. Um, so feel free, and that's what it's meant for. Zoom around in that map uh, to find the site that you really wanna go to, um, or if you have more questions about that site, you can actually go to them and zoom way in, and it's, it's really helpful to see um, what you might be in for, so. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention about the app to, um, you know, depending on how old your phone is, you may or may not get that update. Um, uh, update notice. I did not on uh, my older um, uh, Android phone. It's not that old, so I'm a little disappointed in that, but make sure that you delete it and re-download it because otherwise if you don't, your data will have nowhere to go. So uh, please do make sure that you uh, download the, the newest version of the app. On that note, um, I am going to talk about uh, sort of the the aura, I guess, of uh, milkweeds. I guess uh, just how to identify in how to identify them in the field. And um, milkweed is named as such because you, if you look at the um, the photo on the left, if you tear a piece of the leaf off, it'll bleed red. It's sort of a very milky sort of latexy um, sap that comes out of that leaf. And that's that's sort of the dead giveaway, um, one of the dead giveaways, I guess, for, for milkweed. Um, the, other, the other thing is that uh, the umbrella-like flowering head, what I tend to think of is uh, sort of a fireworks show, right? When they go up in the air and they pop out from that one, one point, um, and that's what a, a milkweed head looks like. Another thing about the sort of recognizing uh, a milkweed is the flower structure is really quite different than most other flowering plants uh, that you'll run across. And this third photo from the left um, really kind of takes a, a hand lens to see all these uh, really nifty features to it. Um, but it has those things that are sort of below those horns we'll call that's the flower petals and so when they're fully um fully displayed they will um 
they will be reflexed like that. Um, and that's, uh, that's what you see there on the right there is that uh, those petals are fully reflexed. Um, just a very, very different type of flower structure that um, milkweeds are, are pretty darn unique in that, in that regard. Um, and and the, just the interesting thing, I guess, about it is it's just such a, a strange flower structure that it makes the pollinators that land on these things, that the horn and the hoods are kind of waxy and kind of slippery. So it makes the, the pollinators sort of, you know, stumble around. And when they do that, they, you know, put their legs in odd places within that flower that makes them carry the pollen to the next flower, which is really, it's very ingenious of this flower. So uh, go ahead to the next one. That might be, oh, finding common milkweed. Um, so what to look for, I guess, so 80 to 90% of the time, um, you will be coming across showy milkweed. That's the most common in our state. And it's, um, it's got those very uh, wide sort of oval leaves on it. And when you see one, you'll uh, most often see many, many others in that area. It's uh, rhizomatous and it, it grows in sort of, it can grow very densely. So um, it's, it's, and it's, and it, it smells pretty good too, to me anyway. Um, so the next slide. So swamp milkweed is another one that you might find, which is, um, what we have found, uh, just a wonderful find that the swamp milkweed, as the name suggests, will grow in much wetter areas, sort of backwaters, uh, really slow waters, um, swampy, as the name says, I guess. Um, and uh, we have found that if swamp and showy are right next to one another, the monarchs seem to prefer the swamp. I have no data back to back that up other than my observations, but it is. Um, it also uh, flowers a little bit longer into the, into the season too. Another one that, that you might run across is the uh, antelope horn or spider milkweed. And this one you will find in the driest areas, uh, sort of disturbed. Um, it's it just sort of, anyway, the places that I've seen it, it sort of stands out like a, a sore thumb because it's pretty darn weedy in the places that I found it anyway. Um, so, but again, you can sort of see that uh, fireworks display of, of that umble. Um, and if you broke off a leaf, you would see that uh, milky sap. And the next one, and this one, I don't know, we just put it in there. Well, yeah, because it's a showstopper. It's in really, really dry areas. Um, we have no idea. I think they found a, an egg on this um, type of milkweed in, Nevada, I don't think they know whether or not it survived or not, but it, it where it grows, it gets very hot and very dry. So um, I, I don't really know, and no one really knows how often uh, monarchs use this pallid milkweed, but it's just, it's such a showstopper when you do, um, do come upon it. And all of these uh, and more milkweeds um, in terms of where they grow, and what they look like is available on a PDF on, that's available on our um, website. Yes, and sorry about that. The uh, swamp milkweed should be Asclepius incarnata. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you, whoever that was who caught that. Appreciate that. Um, and I think, I think that might be it for the milkweed. It's, a, it's an amazing plant, just an incredible pollination uh, story. So for another time. So at this point, I will turn it back over to Amanda. Thanks, Mindy. Sorry about that. That was my my uh, error with the incarnata. I know that's what it should have said. It was a it was a copy paste error. <laughs> um, so I want to give you some information on uh, identifying monarchs by life stage while you're looking for them. 
So when you are checking monarch or milkweed plants for signs of monarch activity, it's helpful to look at specific signs that relate to the various life stages. Monarch eggs are recognizable as cream colored, ribbed football shapes, the size of a pinhead, usually present as a single egg and generally on the underside of a younger milkweed leaf that's near the top of the plant or on really young plants. Um, occasionally a female will lay more th than one egg to a leaf or a plant and this, is, this happens when milkweed are scarce. The monarch caterpillars or larvae have, a dis have distinct black, white, and yellow bands and two pairs of black filaments, one pair on the head and one pair on the rear. Uh, after each molt, the caterpillar is in a later instar or development stage. They consume a lot of plant material as they grow and signs of caterpillar feeding on milkweed is evident at all instars. Caterpillars in the fifth and largest instar are preparing to pupate and they may do so on a branch of milkweed or they will probably journey to another plant nearby uh, that's taller or structures that are within 30 feet or so. Monarchs pupate in a mint green chrysalis with a thin band of gilded bumps and they are beautiful. These are often very difficult to find because they're meant to be camouflaged from predators. Uh, just before the monarch the adult monarch emerges from its chrysalis, the pigmentation on the wing scales develops and the black, orange, and white wing patterns become visible. Uh, after emerging, adult monarchs primarily focus on mating and laying eggs. Females lay eggs pretty much immediately after mating and adults typically mate several times. During the summer breeding, Adults live two to five weeks, but adults that emerge in the late summer and early fall suspend their mating and instead they migrate back to their overwintering grounds. This super generation can live up to eight or nine months and they'll mate in early spring and begin the cycle of breeding uh, again. So prior to this training, we sent out some link, or we sent out links with PDFs with guidelines uh, on how to look for and identify monarchs in the, in the field. These resources show how and where to find monarch eggs on milkweeds and how and where to spot caterpillars and their signs of munching on milkweeds and even tips for uh, locating camouflaged chrysalises. Again, with so few monarchs in the last over this, uh, in the last over last year's overwintering counts, it's probably gonna be really difficult to find them this year, but it is still worth looking. And just remember, you can check out our website, utahpollinatorpursuit.org for these PDFs and other helpful identification information. But you can still encounter lookalikes, so it's helpful to know what the adults look like. Adult male and female monarchs can be distinguished easily. Males have a black scent spot on their hind wing that's not present on the female, and females have thicker black veins on their wings. Uh, adult monarchs have a pattern of white spots on the back submarginal regions of the wing. So just look for those white spots. That's the submarginal region of a butterfly wing. When you're distinguishing caterpillars or chrysalises, remember that monarch caterpillars have two pairs of those black filaments or tentacles and queens, which are closely related, have three pairs. Um, and then queen chrysalises tend to be much smaller, usually about an inch long. And then monarchs, are able to sequester the toxins from milkweeds in the scales of their wings, which makes them taste terrible and to, to predators. And they, this can also disrupt cardiac function. Therefore, a number of other butterfly species have adapted colors and patterns that mimic those of monarchs. Um, so that this, so predators also avoid them as well. Um, a number of other species, I'm sorry, uh, closely related species like queen butterflies and soldier butterflies are also toxic because they feed on milkweed and they look similar, but they can be distinguished by their darker color or uh, darker orange or chestnut colors. Um, and then the pattern of white spots that's on orange rather than on black. And viceroy butterflies are not related, but and they have a band across the hind wing and they're a little bit smaller than monarchs. Monarchs are fairly large butterflies and vice are, are somewhat smaller than that. 
this this band is is easier to see when their wings are closed, uh, but it it uh, monarchs do not have that band at all, so you can you can spot it pretty quickly. Queen and viceroy butterflies are less commonly seen in Utah than monarchs are, but they can still fool humans as well as predators. And um, also for some information and just general information when identifying butterf bumblebees, excuse me, um, it, the first thing to notice is that they have rounded bodies that are covered in thick fur. They have large black eyes and a, a heart-shaped face and dark antennae that have kind of an elbow-like bend. Bumblebee, bumblebees tend to fly slowly around flowers to get a good look and smell and will often buzz against flowers to release the flower's pollen. If multiple flowers are on a single stalk, they kind of climb from one flower to the next rather than flying between them. And bumblebees are also extremely docile. So uh, if, they were, if they're threatened, they'll just raise their middle leg, which is very cute. Um, and they're very reluctant to sting unless they're trapped or they're defending their nest, in which case they are, they're not as friendly. Different species can be identified by the pattern of colored bands or body segments. And these segments can be black, brown, buff, yellow, red, orange, or white. They have dark wings, while honeybees have translucent wings. And like honeybees, bumblebees collect pollen on their rear leg baskets uh, after combing it off of their furry bodies. But unlike honeybees, bumblebees are able to fly, like I said earlier, in low light conditions like dawn and dusk and during cloudy days. And they're active in cooler temperatures of early spring to late summer and in higher altitude habitats like subalpine mountain meadows. So again, the PDFs you received prior to this training include tips on identifying our native, our 18 native bumblebee species. So keep an eye out for that. So another thing is to, to tell them apart from lookalikes. One of the key reasons we ask you to take bum, to take photos of the bumblebees that you see is that a lot of species do look like bumblebees. The most helpful photographs of bumblebee sightings would include uh, a view of the face or just the, the face and the thorax. Um, so the back and, the, and, and a photo of its abdomen, which is why you have a max of, of three photos that you can upload to each observation. This helps us distinguish between flies, carpenter bees, and honeybees that are commonly mistaken for bumblebees. Some things to look for on your own is that heart-shaped face, uh, the crooked antennae, or sorry, the crooked antennae, two pairs of dark wings, um, and that round fuzzy body. Size isn't always a reliable indicator because workers, drones, and queens can be very different sizes for the same species. And some of our cuckoo bumblebees, which are rare, we have two species in Utah that are, well, one is, one is much more common and one is extremely rare. And if you see it, it's great. And they kind of do have a, a smooth abdomen. There's a lot of hair there, but it's not entirely smooth like a, like a carpenter bees would. There's, um, there's some hair on each segment of the abdomen and, and then some very glossy parts of, this, of the abdomen. So if you see something that looks like it's a little hairier than a carpenter bee, should take a photo of it. That'd be amazing because that is a, that is a, a, a possible candidate for a, carp, or for a cuckoo bumblebee. And to give you some information on our frequently asked questions, I will hand this over to Sarah. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, so we have gotten a couple of questions in the chat. So we have a question from Lisa Day who says, in the 90s, I remember a weird year with wind uh, where there were swarms of monarchs uh, driving across Parley's Canyon. Was that some weather event or fluke year? I haven't seen monarchs like that in Utah since. Any information on that? You know, I would say it's possible that that was, um, uh, you saw a population explosion uh, that year, which, it happens every summer if there's a well, it can happen any summer I should say um, if there if the conditions are right if um, if the if the the breeding plants were available and there was a lot of nectar resources and there were just 
uh, there was an absence of pressures, then those uh, individual butterflies can lay a lot of eggs. So the population can get quite big in the summertime if it's allowed to, if it's unhindered. Um, but also sometimes wind patterns, weather patterns can, can move those uh, large numbers uh, around in different places. So it's, it's possible that, that you saw some really spectacular um, rare uh, event. Perfect. Um, and then we have a couple other questions. So folks keep putting them in the chat and we're going to go over a couple of frequently asked questions here um, and then we'll come back to your questions. So one question that gets asked quite frequently is what counts as one observation? Um, and as you can see in the presentation, the answer to that is that any individual monarch life stage per date per location counts as one observation. Um, and the example there is three eggs, one female adult monarch and two pupae would equal one observation. Um, Can I clarify that? That yeah. should be three eggs would be one observation. Yes. One, yeah. one female adult monarch would be one observation. Two pupae would be one observation, but co collectively those would be three separate observations. Her, yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, and then, uh, yeah, similarly for, for the bumblebee observations, similar to that. Um, and you can see that example there, uh, seeing a Hunt's bumblebee would be one observation, brown belted bumblebee, et cetera. Um, and then another question that we get quite often is, can I submit an observation without a photo? And like Mary mentioned, we do need photos to verify the species, um, as well as to, to look at what life stage they're in and verify the sex, um, as well as just uh, make a note of the behavior and what the habitat is like um, around this sighting. So we, we have had some submissions that have not had photos and we unfortunately can't use those. So make sure that you do get photos um, with your submission. And then another question that we get is how should I photograph the bumblebees that I see? Um, and so Mary did mention um, that taking a video can be kind of helpful for, for insects moving around and then looking at stills. But to identify a bumblebee from a photo, we will want to have a, a really in, as in focus as possible details of the head and thorax as well as the abdomen. Um, and as many pictures as you can get, um, ideally one photo for each of these angles is best if that's possible. So, and then uh, one more uh, frequent question that we get is what if I don't have a signal when I'm collecting data? And luckily survey one, two, three will actually save your entry to submit when you're back online. So yeah, you can put in everything into the app and then once you're back in range, you can just push submit. So it's pretty simple, um, which is great. Um, and then, Okay, yeah, that is the last uh, frequently asked question. We do have more resources and videos as well on utahpollinatorpursuit.org. Just um, make a note of that website. Um, on there, you'll also see we have a monarch page as well as a bumblebee page that has ID information. Uh, we've been putting some of those in the chat, but it's all online as well. So feel free to, to refer to all of those um, as you are getting involved this season. And then let's go back to some of the questions that we have been receiving. So let's see, okay, so Jan asks if um, we want pictures of the egg, larva, and pupae if we find them, which the answer is yes. <laughs> um, we, yes, all of the pictures of the pollinators <laughs> we love, so yes. Um, anything to add on that, Amanda? Um so again, if you happen to see eggs and caterpillars in the same location, those would count as separate observations. It's really valuable for us to, uh, to see those things. If you are doing uh, stewardship monitoring, Mindy, you're probably going to have a little bit better answer for that. Um, if there are, I believe there are, uh, you can, you can uh, select multiple boxes if you found multiple things, right? Many, many can probably explain a little bit better. Yeah, so if, if you are um, in a stewardship site, um, the app should let you uh, click. If you see both eggs and larvae, you can click both and the, the app will ask you how many of each you saw. 
Perfect. Um, okay, so we also have a question from Eric Allen. Um, who says, I'm planning to re-landscape a portion of my yard to eliminate grass and put in beneficial plants. Would you suggest one or more milkweed species that need more conservation and would do well in Sandy City? That's always a tough, uh, a little bit of a tough question. Uh, showy milkweed, um, it's kind of amazing how um, tenacious that one is in terms of if you give it just a little bit of extra water, it will uh, it will survive and it will likely spread. So uh, just be a little bit careful with it in your uh, garden settings. Um, in terms of others that need conservation, um, you know, we do have some of the rarer milkweeds, but I don't think that you're going to find um, uh, any seeds or anything that you'd be able to grow those with. Um, so, um, but again, you know that that PDF of the milkweeds in terms of where they grow, you can probably get an idea as to what kind of habitat they might like, and then you know start looking around for seeds, etc. But again, if if you're most interested in in you know potential monarchs, showy milkweed is going to be your best bet. Okay, and then oh um, oh perfect. Okay, so then Anne Greg says, what is the smallest bumblebee we might see? So that is a great question. And I have um, included that in the PDF that we sent out. There are uh, a comparison details of all of the, the Utah bumblebees by body size, uh, kind of the hair quality. Um, one of the common patterns that you would see, because there is some variation between the workers uh, for each species. So of course that makes identification very difficult. But the smallest ones you would see are the, the two-form bumblebee or Bombus bifarius, uh, the central bumblebee, Bombus centralis, the yellow-fronted bumblebee or Bombus flabifrons. Those are probably more uh, um, higher altitude ones. The forest bumblebee, Bombus silvicola is very small. Um, the black-tailed bumblebee or Bombus melanogopygus uh, that one is uh, probably further south. Uh, I saw it in, um, in Helper. I saw Melanopygus in, in Helper. And um, the red belted bumblebee or Rufo sanctus. Um, other than that, I don't, everything else is fairly medium to large sized. So uh, check out that PDF. There's a lot of information in there that will help you um, Get a better sense of what you're looking at if you if you have a bumblebee in in hand or in a, a photo. Thank you, Amanda. Um, and then we have okay. Let's see. So it looks like we've had a couple of specific questions about um, specific areas around Salt Lake uh, that I see that Mary has has answered. So if you have if you want to look at those uh, folks, you can look in the chat. Um, and then we have. Um, Aline asks about aphids and if uh, aphids are harmful to monarchs and if folks should be trying to eliminate them. Well, monarchs are also eating milkweed. So they're, they're not, other than, you know, sort of a, a vague general competition for the same resource. But if you're, if you're, if something's eating your garden or you, then that means they're, your garden is part of the ecosystem. And that's really what we are hoping to encourage that you're creating habitat for these insects. If we eliminate the pests, then we are also eliminating uh, the other things. It, you know, of course, within reason, some things can be become kind of dominant, especially if they're in, um, introduced and and, um, and and can be overgrown. But if if there are aphids eating your milkweed, it's it's probably okay. You should leave them alone. Uh, definitely don't spray any pesticides on them because that would definitely prevent those uh, from being a good resource for your monarchs, if you had some. We have a question from, um, from Sky, who asks again, kind of about the multiple observations. So Sky says, if we see multiple specimens of the same bee species along a five to seven mile trail, would you like us to record and submit those as separate observations? Yeah, that's a really good question. If you are seeing the same species I would say, I mean, especially if you're going several miles, um, even, even once a mile, if you see the same bee 
the, the same species every mile or so, it, it would be great as a voucher for uh, your observation. So I, that would be awesome. That would be awesome. Perfect. And then we have also a couple questions um, about the recording and what we'll be sending out. So I'll just reiterate that we will be sending out this as a recording. Um, and we had a question about the chat specifically. We, um, yeah, we, we, we are happy to save the chat um, and send it out as well with those questions and answers and, and all of that. Thank you for asking that, Tanya. Um, and then uh, Louisa, the note on the PDFs, those are all available on the website and we also will be sending out those ID PDFs in our follow-up email. Um, they're also found in your last email too, so they're kind of everywhere, but yeah, you'll be receiving a follow-up email with those um, soon. Can we mention where those would be um, found on the website? Yes, so the so the Bumblebee uh, ID PDF. Well, okay, first I'll say that they're all found um, on the Wild Utah Project page uh, for plants and pollinators. There's just a section for resources that has them all in one place. Or if you're interested in looking at um, the web page that has a lot more information um, on utahpollinatorpursuit.org, you can go into the Monarch or the Bumblebee section and they both have ID pages that include those PDFs as well as some more uh, good stuff on the pages. So yeah, those are in multiple, multiple spots, they're great resources. Um, okay, and then let's see. So Danielle asks, when is it okay to step in? So if, um, let's see, okay, an, an example that comes to mind is what if we are checking for eggs and knock some off, or we knock down a caterpillar or cocoons, um, things like that. Um, so if an egg ends up being accidentally knocked off, they, they are fairly, fairly tightly anchored to the leaf. So if you're being gentle, that's like the first, uh, the first, approach would just be to look at be very the, the 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 eggs can be fairly central in the leaf so uh just go go through these leaves when you're looking very very gently um if you do knock one off it's probably going to disappear before you try to find it again um if it's near a stand of milkweed and, and it's a particularly um robust caterpillar that hatches from it then they're still going to have milkweed around if they can make it back to a leaf, then they can. If they don't, you know, say la vie. Sometimes that happens. Um, if you if you feel that you have to uh, in, inter, intervene somewhere and you see somebody else that might be um, um, handling uh, these butterflies in a way that seems um, harmful to them. Um, share some information with them. I mean, of course, at all times, just be as um, as as uh, diplomatic as possible and share uh, their importance and, and the fact that they are um, in extremely dire numbers. And um, the best you can do is is spread education. That would be my answer there. If I could, this just reminded me, um, I'm just pasting in the chat right now, um, this PDF, it's a flyer about the project. Um, and that's also available on the project page and the pollinator pursuit page as well. Um, and so if you are out making observations and somebody asks what you're doing, it, it wouldn't hurt to have a couple of flyers in your backpack and then you could hand one to them and um, that way you don't have to like memorize your talking points or be put on the spot. You could just hand them a flyer about the project. Um, we wish we could give you guys all official caps and shirts and things like that, but um, at least there you have some information you can give right away. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so then we have another question from Anne who asks, if I see a bumblebee at the same plant in my yard every day, how often do you want to hear about that? So every day, <laughs> every day, why not? <laughs> it, what, it, what it probably means is that you have a colony near your house and that's fantastic. That would be great to know because if we have a time frame for when that, that colony is active in that area, that's that's really valuable information. So yeah, 
the more the merrier. Yeah. Um, okay, that wraps up the questions we have so far in the chat. We have a couple minutes to seven. So if people have questions coming to mind, feel free to just type them in the chat. Um, and, um, and yeah, I'll also just note while we're kind of waiting, uh, make sure that you mark Wild Utah Project as a safe sender uh, with all of our, our information and, and talk we're having about the follow-up email. Just make sure that you are receiving our emails um, that we're going to your primary inbox. However, it works for your, for your email. Just make sure that you're receiving those. We don't want you to miss out on anything. Um, let's see, I don't see any others coming in. Anything else that uh, you, Amanda, Mary, or Min Mindy have to add? I don't keep keep those questions coming about the the site. Some of the state WMAs look really exciting to me. Um, I know some of them are very large areas, but do feel free to, you know, make two sites out of that one boundary. And that that information too, I I sort of go through on the video for the app as well. But some of those WMAs look very interesting botanically as well as for uh, monarch habitat. Yes, and people who are having questions about um, the app, those videos are great that Mindy's put together uh, for, for how to download it and going through it step by step. So make sure that you take a look at those. Um, and then we have a question from Monica and Zeke who ask, um, so they said they have a colony under their deck and should they count the amount of bees in it? So, um, I would say that just don't, don't, it would be better if we know what, what flowers they're, they're visiting. So if you have them, if you have uh, photos of them while they're foraging, that's great. If they're walking around, that's great. But if you get too close to that nest, like you really do run the risk of getting stung because they are defensive. Um, and the other thing is the size of the, of the colony is less valuable for us because that number can change. You know, those, those bees are um, the one, a worker from the beginning of the season probably won't live the entire season. So th that number ne isn't necessarily um, um, meaningful for us, but it really would be helpful for us to see what, what flowers they're visiting throughout the year. So if you, have, if you have flowers in your garden that are providing nectar to these bees, that's great. Take photos of them on those flowers. That's perfect for us. And then it helps us know what species you have too. And good for you for having a colony. That's like, I mean, that's like a goal of mine. That's what yeah, I want. <laughs> Goals. <laughs> um, okay, well, I don't see any other questions and it is seven. So I think, I think we've covered a lot. Um, again, if folks have any questions, feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, there's some, con some contact information if things come up. Um, yeah, uh, Amanda and Mindy and Mary know all of the details about these species and everything. So please feel, just feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, and thanks again as well for attending and for being part of this project. We cannot say enough that it's only possible because of you and um, yeah, thank you so much for being here. Have thanks wonderful... everyone. This has been wonderful. We're really excited to get started again this year. Yeah.